talk about perhaps the most important topic in neurology localization in neurology all i need is about an hour or so of your kind attention i'll be starting right from the cortex the lobes the thalamus hypothalamus internal capsule brain stem cranial nerves peripheral nerve neuromuscular junction and muscle and it's perhaps the most important topic in neurology i i really prepared well and i hope it will be very useful to you all both undergraduates and postgraduate students yeah as uh, dr kishan rao has already said i am the medical author of the book focused neurology it's available online from all leading booksellers including amazon uh, all the important concepts of neurology i put it in a question answer format it's available in the book focused neurology as sir has already said i have my own youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts i have more than 8000 subscribers and nearly nearly 250 plus neurology videos almost all the topics of neurology i have covered so if you want detailed discussion or detailed uh, explanation of any particular sub topic you can always come back to my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts yeah these are all the various achievements yeah localization in clinical neurology i am dr srinivas neurologist from rajmandri andhra pradesh my email is sriklpm@gmail.com so if you have any doubts or if you want to connect to me you can connect to me on my email yeah uh, i am going to start from the cortex work down downstream to the muscle so all i need is your att kind attention so we'll start off with the cortex lobes the frontal lobe parietal lobe temporal lobe and occipital lobe the frontal lobe the functions of the frontal lobe are that there's an emotional restraint judgment reasoning memory especially the immediate memory and abstract thinking in fact if you see the lower animals with human beings we are placed highest in the hierarchy because of two reasons one our super intelligence and language and second the way we use our fingers and manipulate known as manual dexterity because of the language and intelligence we are placed highest in the hierarchy when compared to the animals and intelligence is your reasoning judgment emotional restraint abstract thinking everything comes in the frontal lobe especially the prefrontal cortex that is so well developed in human beings as compared to the lower animals that's why we are bestowed with so much of intelligence and of course the language and the manual dexterity so if the frontal lobe gets dysfunctional there will be social disinhibition there will be poor judgment we will have silly behavior the lack of memory especially the immediate memory and impairment of abstract thinking the other important functions of the frontal lobe are the motor cortex the motor cortex is responsible for all our movements so any movement which has to take place has to take place through the corticospinal tract which comes from the frontal lobe the corticospinal tract comes from the motor cortex descends at the level of the medial oblongate and crosses over to the opposite side and then goes to the opposite side and therefore if one side of the cortex gets affected the person will have weakness of motor power or hemiparesis on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract crosses at the level of the medulla and goes to the opposite side so weakness of the contralateral side the other important functions of the frontal lobe are that we have the speech centers the language area which is known as the broca's area which is in the frontal lobe here in we should know an important concept known as the dominant cortex what is this dominant cortex and what is non dominant cortex most of the right handers i am a right handed so most of the right handers more than 95% of the time the speech centers are situated in the left cortex what we call it as the dominant cortex so dominant cortex is that cortex where the speech centers are situated and the non dominant cortex is very important for spatial orientation so nature and god has beautifully assigned two important functions to two different sides of the cortex the left side of the cortex is responsible for language or speech and the right side of the cortex is responsible for the spatial orientation and therefore if a person god forbid develops an infarct in the left side of the frontal cortex person will have not only hemiplegia but also aphasia he will not be able to speak but if a person has got left hemiplegia 
because of the right frontal cortex involvement, he has got only left hemiplegia and usually they will not have a aphasia because the speech centers are situated on the left side and not on the right side. So the frontal lobe basically has got the Broca's area, the dominant cortex. Broca's area is responsible for fluency, word output. Wernick's area is responsible for comprehension, understanding the speech. And the Wernick's area and the Broca's area are connected through arcuate fasciculus, which is responsible for repetition of speech. So if Wernick's area, that is the temporal area, if it gets affected, person's comprehension gets affected, he cannot understand the speech. If the arcuate fasciculus gets affected, he cannot repeat the speech, whatever he hears. And if the Broca's area, that is the frontal lobe, gets affected, he cannot speak fluently. The normal word output is 100 to 110 words per minute. If the Broca's area gets affected, the words get reduced to as less as 10 words or even lesser than that. So that is known as non-fluent, but very sensible speech because the Wernick's area, which is in the temporal lobe is intact. Patient can understand, but he cannot speak fluently. So this is known as non-fluent, but sensible speech. Suppose if you ask me, what is my name? I have to tell my name as Srinivas. God forbid, if I have Broca's up area, I'll be struggling. But I know my name is Srinivas, so I'll tell Sri, Sri, Ni, Srinivas. So it will be a non-fluent but very sensible speech and they'll have hemiplegia on the opposite side. Fine. I told that the language, all the components of language are situated on the dominant cortex. But is there any component which is situated on the non-dominant cortex? Yes, there's one component of language which is situated in the non-dominant cortex that is known as prosody. That is you are giving emotion to your speech. For example, I always give this example. Suppose you meet your friend who's coming from US after 10 years. So you'd like to say, oh, my friend, how are you? You get excited. You give emotion to the language. So if the, if the non-dominant cortex, the frontal side, the non-dominant cortex, the right side gets affected, that emotion to the language is gone. So when you meet your friend after 10 years, it will be a flat speech. Hi, my friend, how are you? I'm, I'm very happy to see you. So there is no infliction. There's no emotion to speech. So all the components of the speech language area go to the dominant cortex, but prosody, that emotion to the speech goes to the non-dominant cortex. And the language of all these three, that is comprehension, repetition, and fluency, the fluency is present in the Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe. So if the Broca's area, the frontal lobe gets affected, they'll have non-fluent, but very sensible speech. But if non-dominant cortex gets affected, they'll have lack of prosody, right? Another important part of the frontal lobe is the frontal eye fields area number eight. We have two kinds of movements. One is saccadic movement, the fast eye movement. Second is the slow following movement. Imagine someone knocks at the door. I immediately want to see who's knocking at the door. So this fast eye movement is known as saccadic eye movement. It originates from the frontal eye fields area number eight and goes to the pons on the opposite side, which is known as paramedian pontine reticular formation, which pulls the eyes towards its side. So when the left frontal cortex is stimulated, the eyes goes to the right side. These are known as saccadic eye movements. Then we have another kind of movement, the slow following movement. For example, I watch a nice interesting shuttlecock match going between uh, 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 Sindhu and some other world champion. So I keep following the shuttlecock like this. These following movements are known as pursuit eye movements, which originates from the parietal lobe and goes to the PPRF. So the saccadic eye movements comes from the left front, from the front life fields area number eight, goes and crosses to the opposite side of the PPRF. PPRF connects the lateral rectus on the same side and medial rectus to the MLF on the opposite side. So it pulls the eyes towards its side. So in the left frontal cortex is stimulated, the right PPRF gets stimulated, the eyes goes to the opposite side. So if a person has got left frontal lobe infarct, he cannot push the eyes to the opposite side. So eyes will be looking toward the same side, but hemiplegia is in the opposite side because corticospinal tract crosses at the level of the medial oblongate and goes to the opposite side. So eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side, it is a frontal lobe in fact. Just by looking at the gaze and the hemiplegia, you can place the lesion. So eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion. Imagine if the pons gets affected, PPRF gets affected, it cannot pull the eyes towards its side. So eyes will go to the opposite side. 
corticospinal tract also descends at the level of the medulla oblongata and goes to the opposite side. So eye is looking towards the side of hemiplegia is a pontine lesion. Eye is looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion. That is the beauty of clinical localization. That is the beauty of clinical neurology. Just looking at the patient, eye gaze and hemiplegia, you can place the lesion. Eye is looking to one side, hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion, especially frontal eye fields area number eight is affected. Eye is looking towards the side of hemiplegia is a pontine lesion. Yeah, this is about all the important points of the frontal lobe localization. Now let's see the parietal lobe localization. As the frontal lobe is responsible for movements, parietal lobe is responsible for the appreciation of sensations. So frontal lobe is for motor and parietal lobe is for sensory. Very, very important point. So when the parietal lobe gets affected, the sensations perceived by the parietal cortex gets affected. We have two types of sensations, the primary sensations, namely touch, pain, temperature, position, joint, and vibration sense, which are perceived at the basic level, that is from the receptors to the thalamus. But what is perceived from thalamus to the parietal cortex, that is the cortical sensations are tactile localization, two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, stereognosis, and barognosis. So if parietal lobe per se gets affected and other uh, tracts are intact, so you have the primary sensations being intact, that is touch, pain, position, joint, vibration sense being intact, but the sensations perceived by the parietal cortex, that is the cortical sensations get affected, namely tactile localization, two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, stereognosis, barognosis. Tactile localization, the pinpoint, the pinpoint area where, where a person can tell is known as tactile localization. They can precisely tell where the person has uh, touched them. Then we have two point discrimination. If you put two points and if the person is able to feel discreetly the two points, you call that as two point discrimination. If it is felt as one point, that means it's not sensitive to the two point discrimination. Two point discrimination is highest in the lips and the fingertips. Why are they highest in the lips and fingertips? Because if you see the sensory harmonicless, the representation of the face and the hands are the highest. And therefore the two points can be appreciated as distinct and separate when placed at these particular areas because the sensory homonucleus has got highest representation for the face and hands. And tactile two-point discrimination is least at the back of the trunk. So highest in the lips or face and the fingertips. So that is known as two-point discrimination. Stereognosis. What is stereognosis? You give something like pen, ask him to close his eyes and ask him to appreciate what it is. Even despite closing the eyes, if he's able to feel and tell what it is, that means his parietal lobe is intact. That means his uh, stereognosis is intact. Graphesthesia is that you, you show him the hand, writes a number like six or three. Ask the patient to close his eyes, write a number like six or three and ask him to tell what number he has written. If he is able to tell despite closing the eyes, the number written on his hand, that is known as graphesthesia. And, and feeling the weight on suicides and comparing it is known as barognosis. So the parietal lobe gets affected. The dysfunction produces loss of tactile localization, two-point discrimination, stereognosis, and graphesthesia. The second important function of the parietal lobe is that the visual pathway. The visual pathway starts from the eye, goes to the optic chiasma, and as optic radiation goes to the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, and finally goes to the occipital lobe. It is the occipital lobe which gives the meaning to the vision. Whatever you see, the meaning is given, the perception of vision is given by the occipital lobe. But they have to travel to the parietal lobe and temporal lobe. So if parietal lobe gets affected, they'll have homonymous hemianopia, especially the inferior parts gets affected. That the representation is just the opposite side. Right side of the vision goes to the left side of the cortex. Left side of the vision goes to the right side of the cortex. The top of the vision goes to the temporal lobe. The bottom of the vision goes to the parietal lobe, which is on the upper part. So the parietal lobe gets affected. They'll have homonymous hemianopia, but inferior parts gets affected, which is known as inferior quarantonopia. And very important is apraxia. What is praxis? Praxis is action. An, an inability to perform a learned motor act is known as apraxia. So you have... Uh, two types of apraxia, idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia in the dominant parietal cortex, and two other apraxias known as dressing apraxia and construction apraxia in the non-dominant cortex. In fact, non-dominant cortex is more to do with the spatial orientation. So construction apraxia and dressing apraxia is more to do with the spatial orientation. So we have two important lesions, idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia.
the frontal lobe per se is important to actual performance of movements but the idea how to perform is given from the parietal lobe and goes to the frontal lobe so if the parieto frontal connection gets affected the idea how to perform is affected so they cannot imagine and perform and act for example if you ask him to imagine how to write with a pen he can't but if you actually give him a pen and write he can write because the frontal lobe is intact it is only the parieto frontal connections are affected so imagination is affected but if you give a real lifetime object he can perform so this is known as idiomotor apraxia since with real lifetime object is able to perform activities of daily living are not impaired in idiomotor apraxia which is fortunately the more common apraxia in ideational apraxia the frontal lobe which is responsible for the actual performance of the movement per se is affected so they cannot perform an act with the even given a real lifetime object in a sequential manner for example if you give him a pen and ask him to write he may take the pen but without opening the cap he may start writing and then after writing he may open the cap and therefore he goes out of sequence he cannot perform an act with a real lifetime object in a sequential manner they go out of sequence so activities of daily living are impaired in ideational apraxia visual spatial integration the non dominant as i said in the beginning of my lecture the language area is beautifully assigned to the dominant cortex and the spatial orientation is assigned to the non dominant cortex right side of the cortex so right side of the cortex produces left hemi neglect but left side of the cortex usually does not produce right hemi neglect what is the reason the right parietal cortex controls both the right and the left extra personal space whereas the left parietal lobe controls only the right extra personal space so the left parietal lobe gets affected the right extra personal space is affected but this is compensated by the intact right parietal lobe which controls both the right and the left extra personal space so left parietal lobe does not produce right hemi neglect whereas if right parietal lobe gets affected both the right and the left extra personal space is affected the right extra personal space is compensated by the intact left parietal lobe but there's no compensation of the left side and therefore right parietal lobe or the non dominant parietal lobe produces left hemi neglect so much so that they deny even the existence of the left side of the body if you pinch their hand he'll ask whose hand you're pinching at he completely seems to neglect the left side of the body this is known as anosognosia denial of the existence of the left side of the body patients deny owning their own contralateral limbs and they have constructional apraxia and dressing apraxia if you ask them to draw a cube they can't if you ask them to dress they can't dress they can't put their hands correctly into the sleeves <clears throat> because the spatial orientation is affected so constructional apraxia or dressing apraxia are seen in the non dominant parietal lobe yeah now now that we have done with frontal lobe parietal lobe we'll go to the temporal lobe temporal lobe is basically concerned with memory especially the recent memory hippocampus memory always remember as hippocampus <coughs> we have three types of memory immediate memory i give some uh, seven digit number or a phone number ask them to repeat immediately within seconds if they are able to repeat it immediately that goes to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is known as immediate memory after 15 minutes if they are able to repeat three unrelated objects that means their recent memory or episodic memory is intact which goes to the hippocampus and the long term memory the childhood memory is the school where you have studied or all known as remote memory or semantic memory which goes to the lateral temporal lobe so immediate or recent memory recent memory always think of hippocampus and hippocampus is present in the temporal lobe so if the temporal lobe gets affected the hippocampus gets affected the recent memory or episodic memory is lost they can't repeat after 15 minutes the short term memory is lost and another interesting point of uh, temporal lobe is that there's an there's an organ known as amygdala amygdala is the organ responsible for memory of fear in fact i always feel all students should have memory of fear because they should have exams they should have fear then only they'll study if there's no fear they're not going to study they're not going to do well in the exams so memory of fear in amygdala is essential for your development and advancement and kluver and busey did an elegant experiment on on monkeys they also thought amygdala is responsible for memory of fear but they wanted to prove it so they removed amygdala from the monkeys and what they found was astonishing the moment the amygdala was uh, removed the memory of fear was gone generally monkeys and snakes are antagonistic they are hostile but once the amygdala was removed monkeys became very friendly with snakes they, they started playing with snakes putting snakes around the neck and started playing with them this grows to this goes to prove that amygdala is responsible for memory of fear and the moment amygdala is removed the memory of fear is lost which is known as kluver busey syndrome and the emotions the limbic lobe goes to the again the temporal lobe is responsible for all emotions in fact 
memory and emotions are very closely placed and therefore anything to do with emotion you will remember it better than anything without emotion for example you might have had uh, three days back uh, uh, breakfast or lunch there's no emotion in it you tend to forget it but but you have done exceedingly well in your exam you are you are the university topper there's an emotion to that you'll remember it forever or god forbid some uh, tragedy has occurred someone has died in your family you'll remember it because there's an emotion attached to it so emotion and memory they go together both are present in the temporal lobe limbic lobe uh, and uh, memories with emotions are better remembered than memory without emotions and then as i said in the initial part of my lecture language basically has got three common one vernix area for comprehension arcuate passages for repetition broca's area for fluency so vernix area which is present in the temporal lobe if they get affected the comprehension is lost they cannot understand but since broca's area is intact they keep on speaking so it is a it is a nonsense but fluent speech so suppose you ask me what my name is so so suppose you ask what my name is instead of telling my name is you know i don't understand i don't have comprehension but broca's area is intact so i can speak fluently so if you ask me what my name is i said oh this pen is nice i'll start writing with my pen i'll be totally talking nonsense but fluent speech in irrelevant answer and temporal lobe is not concerned with movement at all cortico spinal tract does not go to the through the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe it goes to the medial lobe along it on the opposite side and therefore when temporal lobe gets affected they will not have hemiplegia because cortico spinal tract does not traverse to the temporal lobe so if vernix area gets affected they'll have aphasia a non uh, a fluent but nonsense speech but they will not have hemiplegia whereas broca's area they have non fluent but sensible speech but they will have hemiplegia because cortico spinal tract traverses to the frontal lobe whereas cortico spinal tract does not travel through the temporal lobe so they will not have hemiplegia and as i said the optic radiations goes to the parietal and temporal lobe so if temporal lobe gets affected they'll have homonymous hemianopia but this time superior quadrantonopia yeah finally occipit lobe as i said though we see through our eyes it is the occipit lobe which gives meaning to what we see so occipital lobe is responsible for visual processing the visual information everything the meaning to vision is given by occipital lobe and the optic radiations going to the parietal temporal lobe finally goes to the occipital cortex so if the occipital cortex gets affected they'll have homonym homonymous semi anopia with macular sparing that is the center of the vision being spared why macular sparing one macula is supplied not only by the posterior cerebral artery but also by middle cerebral artery second the macula has got a wide representation so usually the macula is spared two other fascinating concepts of the occipital lobe are that occipital temporal connections being affected and occipital parietal connections being affected occipital temporal connections are responsible to give what it gives meaning to the vision what of vision occipital parietal connections are responsible for where of the vision so occipital temporal connections are responsible for what of vision occipital parietal connections are responsible to for where of vision so if occipital temporal connections are affected what of vision is affected for example they can see the face but they cannot identify whose face is it so they cannot give meaning to what has been seen what of vision is affected classic example is prosopagnosia inability to identify known faces whereas if occipital parietal connections get affected where of vision is affected they cannot integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision for example if they are looking at the forest we see the forest in its entirety but they'll get stuck to a particular part like a tree they cannot see the entire forest they'll be only seeing the tree so where of vision is lost they miss the forest for the tree they cannot integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision if you ask them to identify big a's and small a's they'll be identifying small a's because it falls in the center of the vision and they can say small a's but big a does not fall in the center of vision so they think it's an oblique line or horizontal line and they think it is not a so bedside testing of a uh, 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 simultagnosia is asking them to draw big a's small a's and ask them to encircle it they'll be encircling the small a's but not big a's in fact if occipital parietal connection get affected especially the border zone in fact between the pca and the mc in fact we call that as a balance syndrome border zone in fact or balance syndrome so balance syndrome has got basically three components one is a simultagnosia they cannot identify the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision they'll have optic ataxia and oculomotor apraxia they cannot hold on to an object or follow an object with their vision so this is a classic uh, syndrome known as balance syndrome so they'll have occipital lobe being affected they'll have visual field defects homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing 
Occipital temporal connections get affected. What of vision gets affected? Example, prosopagnosia, inability to identify known faces. Occipital parietal connections get affected. Where of vision gets affected? Example, asymmetrical anognosia. Classic example is balance syndrome. The triad is oculomotor apraxia, optic apraxia, and asymmetrical anognosia. Right. Perhaps this is the most important part of our discussion, the internal capsule, because at MBBS final year exam, this is the part they are going to stress and ask upon. Even for final year MD general medicines, even for DM neurology, it is going to be the internal capsule, which is very, very important when we are, talk, when we are talk, talking or discussing a case of hemiplegia. So internal capsule basically has the three components, anterior limb, genu, and posterior limb. And just beneath or underneath of the internal capsule, we call that as the retro or sublentricular part of the internal capsule. So from the cortex, the corticospinal tract comes from the cortex, from motor homunculus, goes to the internal capsule, midbrain, pons, medulla, crosses over to the opposite side, goes to the anterior homunculus of the spinal cord. So from the cortex to the anterior homunculus of the spinal cord, we call it as an upper motor neuron. What comes from the anterior homunculus, we call it as a lower motor neuron. So again, upper motor neuron, there are two components. One from the cortex to the cranial part, motor part of the cranial non-nuclei, what we call as corticobulbar fibers. From the cortex to the anterior homunculus of the spinal cord, what we call as a corticospinal tract. So upper motor neuron, there are two components, corticobulbar fibers till the cranial motor nuclei and corticospinal fibers till the anterior homunculus of the spinal cord. Likewise, lower motor neuron, which comes from the motor nucleus. Again, there are two components. What comes from the anterior horn cells as the peripheral nerve is a lower motor neuron. What comes from the motor part of the cranial nerve as cranial nerve is also a lower motor neuron. So lower motor neuron, there are two components, cranial nerves and peripheral nerves. Upper motor neuron also, there are two components, corticobulbar fibers and corticospinal fibers. So all these corticobulbar, corticospinal fibers, upper motor neuron, condensed together in internal capsule. But where are they condensed together and where they form a compact bundle? It is in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So very, very important internal capsule. You are always talking about the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, you have the corticospinal fibers condensed. And therefore, a small lesion of internal capsule will produce a dense hemiplegia. What is dense hemiplegia? The weakness of the upper limbs is equal to the weakness of the lower limbs. Whereas if the anterior cerebral artery is involved, the frontal lobe is involved, the lower limbs are more involved than the upper limb. If the middle cerebral artery is involved, the upper limb is involved more than the lower limb. But if internal capsule, since all the fibers are condensed together, a small lesion will produce a dense hemiplegia where the weakness of the upper limb is equal to the weakness of the lower limb. So the corticospinal fibers are condensed together. The sensations, the thalamic sensations are conducted are condensed together. So if there's a lesion in the posterior limb, they'll have dense hemiplegia, dense hemisthesia. And the retro and subdenticular part, we have the visual and auditory radiations. So if the internal carotid artery gets affected, this particular part in the posterior limb, they'll have hemiplegia, hemisthesia, and homonymous, hemi, uh, homonymous hemianopia. Right. The other parts of the internal capsule are the anterior limb, where you have the fronto ponto cerebellar connections going on. In fact, if you see pons, there's a dense cerebellar connections going to the cerebellum. Cerebellum is basically for appreciating the sensations. All the afferent fibers go to the cerebellum. So a dense bundle goes from the frontal lobe through the pons and goes to the cerebellum. So if the anterior limb gets affected, they can have cerebellar manifestations because fronto ponto cerebellar functions gets affected. Tape circuit, which is responsible for memory, also goes to the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And saccadic path, which travels from the front life fields area number eight to the PPRF, goes to the anterior limb of the internal capsule. So the anterior limb of the internal capsule gets affected. They'll have frontal ponto cerebellar dysfunction, tape circuit being affected, memory being affected, saccadic pathway being affected. The corticobulbar fibers that is supplying the facial uh, nerve nucleus, seventh nerve, and all the cranial nerve nuclei, especially the face goes to the genu of the internal capsule. So they'll have more of face and then a slight involvement of the hand. Whereas the posterior limb is involved, they'll have dense hemiplegia, hemisthesia, and homonymous hemianopia. The internal capsule, the blood supply is also very important. The entire upper part is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. The lower part, you can divide it into three parts, upper one third, middle one third, lower one third, AC, PC, AC. AC is the anterior cerebral artery, a branch of which is hubenous artery. PC is the post communicating artery. And the third is the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch of internal carotid artery. So if the anterior choroidal artery, a branch of internal carotid artery gets affected, the posterior part of the internal capsule will get affected, posterior limb of the internal capsule gets affected, they'll have a classic hemiplegia, hemisthesia, and homonymous hemianopia. So this is going to be a very, very important slide. Uh, you can always go through this slide. It's, it's present in the YouTube. And again, go through all the important parts and the blood supply of the internal capsule, which is very, very important. Right. Now let's go to the thalamus. 
thalamus again you have very you have four important nucleus anterior nucleus dorsal nuclei ventral nuclei and ventrolateral nuclei it is the ventral nuclei which is very important because the spinothalamic tract and the posterior column goes through it and produces hemesthesia. But the other nuclei are the anterior nuclei, which contains the mammillary body and cingulate gyrus, so they are concerned with the limbic system emotions. The dorsal nuclei, lateral posterior nucleus, and pulvina, the extra genuclate, calocrine vision, so blind sight. Completely blind person still able to crudely localize and respond to visual stimuli, that is the pulvinar and extra genuclear calocrine uh, vision being affected. The ventral nuclei very, very important in thalamus, like your posterior limb of the internal capsule. In thalamus, the most important part is the ventral nuclei because the spinothalamic tract, the main tract, spinothalamic tract and posterior column go to the ventral nuclei and therefore they'll produce hemesthesia on the opposite side. If they get dysfunctional, they can have thalamic pain also. And the ventrolateral nuclei, the motor activity through basal ganglia and cerebellum. So if thalamus gets affected, they can have emotions being affected, they can have vision being affected, they have sensory disturbances, they have motor disturbances, they can have dorsometral nuclei uh, of the thalamus they can have memory disturbance. So thalamus can produce diverse clinical manifestations. Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, the function of the hypothalamus is appetite, thirst, osmolality, temperature, and sexual functions. And therefore, the dysfunction results in hyperphagia, diapers insipidus, SIADH, sexual, and temperature dysregulation. Basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, there are three important structures in basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, the caudate nucleus, the subthalamus. The substantia nigra causes hypokinesia, decrease in movement. Classic example is Parkinson's disease. Any person who's got a movement disorder, you approach it in two ways, hyperkinesia, either excessive movement or hypokinesia, decreased movement. So if substantia nigra gets affected, uh, example Parkinson's disease, they have decreased movement. Classic example is Parkinson's disease. If caudate nucleus gets affected, they'll have hyperkinesia, excessive movement. Example, chorea. If subthalamus gets affected, they'll have hemibalismus. Right. Now, now that we are done with the lobar functions and thalamus, hypothalamus, now we'll go to the brainstem. Very, very important. Midbrain, pons, and thalamus. Midbrain, two important points. As I said, you have horizontal gaze, you have vertical gaze. Horizontal gaze, there are two components, the saccadic movement, the quick movement, and the pursuit, the slow movement. All the horizontal eye movement, the center is the pons. Vertical gaze, again, we have two types of movements, up gaze looking up, down gaze looking down. Or the vertical gaze, the center is midbrain. Very, very important. The center for vertical gaze is midbrain. The center for horizontal gaze is pons. Why is it important? I can give a classic example, locked in syndrome wherein the pons gets affected. When the pons gets affected, the horizontal gaze gets affected. So person cannot see eyes towards the right or to the left. When pons gets affected, corticobulbar, corticospinal fibers get affected. He cannot move upper limbs and the lower limbs. So it's totally locked in. The only movement present is up and down vertical eye movements because midbrain is intact. So this is known as locked in syndrome. The pons gets affected. All the horizontal eye movements get affected. Not very close upper limbs and lower limbs gets affected and midbrain is intact. The vertical eye movements are spared. So midbrain is responsible for vertical gaze and pons is responsible for horizontal gaze. So if midbrain gets affected, the vertical gaze gets affected, especially the up gaze gets affected because up gaze fibers cross and then descend, whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away down. So when anything goes and impinges on the top of the midbrain, it is the crossing up gaze fibers which gets affected. So they'll have impairment of up gaze. Example, class okay. example is Parinaut syndrome or hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus also goes and impinges on the top of the midbrain. So they cannot look upwards. They'll be only looking downwards, which is known as sunset sign. And we have the third and fourth cranial nerves in the midbrain. So they'll have ipsilateral third nerve palsy and fourth cranial nerve palsy. Corticospinal tracts are involved. So they'll have contralateral hemiplegia. Substantia nigra is involved. So they'll have Parkinson's disease. No. As the midbrain is responsible for vertical gaze, pons is responsible for horizontal gaze. So if pons gets affected, the horizontal gaze gets affected. Sixth and seventh nerves gets affected. So they'll have ipsilateral sixth and seventh nerve palsy. And the corticospinal tract yeah. gets affected. They'll have opposite contralateral hemiplegia. Medial oblongata. Here, a very, very important concept. Medial oblongata, we have to divide it into two parts. One, medial part of the medial oblongata. Second is the lateral part of the medial oblongata. Medial part of the medial oblongata, we have the posterior column, we have the 12th nerve, we have the corticospinal tract. 
So the medial part of the medial oblongata gets affected. The posterior column gets affected. So they'll have hemisthesia. That 12th nerve gets affected. They'll have 12th nerve palsy. And corticospinal tract gets affected. They'll have hemiplegia. The lateral part of the medulla, the common is one of the common symptoms, what we see in clinical practice is the Wallenberg syndrome, where the lateral part of the medulla oblongata is affected. Mind you, the corticospinal tract is in the medial part of the medulla oblongata, not in the lateral part of the medulla oblongata. So lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome does not produce any pleasure because corticospinal tract is in the medial part, whereas Wallenberg syndrome is the lateral part of the medulla oblongata. So if the lateral part of the medulla oblongata gets affected, the spinal tract of the fifth nerve gets affected, spinothalamic tract gets affected, vestibular nuclei gets affected, inferior cerebellar peduncle gets affected, sympathetic tracts get affected. So they'll have ipsilateral facial sensory loss with contralateral body loss of pain and temperature, vertigo harness syndrome. So far, I have said so many important points, but how to remember the entire brainstem? It is so much of information. I'll give a simple rule, rule of four. Just remember rule of four, you will remember entire brainstem. Four cranial nerves are present in the medulla oblongata. Four cranial nerves are present in the pons. Four cranial nerves are present in the midbrain and above. The four cranial nerves present in the medulla oblongata are 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. So medulla oblongata means 9, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves are affected. Four cranial nerves are present in the pons. Five, six, seven, eight. So if sixth, seventh, five, fifth, six, seventh, eighth are affected, pons is affected. Four cranial nerves are present in midbrain and above. Third and fourth in midbrain and one and two above midbrain. So four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata, 9, 10, 11, 12. Four cranial nerves in pons, five, six, seven, eight. Four cranial nerves in midbrain and above. Three, four in midbrain, one, two above. So if you can remember this, easy to remember the cranial nerves which are present in each part of the brainstem. And second thing, tracks. How do you remember tracks? The tracks which start with the letter S are placed sideways. The tracks which start with the letter M are placed in the medial part of the brainstem. So medial lemniscus, that is the posterior column, motor tract, that is the corticospinal tract, MLF, medial medial longitudinal fasciculus are all placed medially and the motor part of the cranial nerves. So all four, which start with the letter M are placed medially. Motor part of the cranial nerve, medial longitudinal fasciculus, motor tract, corticospinal tract, and medial lemniscus, posterior column are placed medially. Four tracts which start with the letter S are placed sideways. The spinothalamic tract, which is concerned with pain and temperature, the sympathetic tract, and the sensory part of the fifth nerve, they're all placed sideways and sensory part of the cranial nerve. So sensory part of the cranial nerves the sympathetic tract, spinothalamic tract are all placed sideways. So sideways, the tracks which start with the letter S are placed sideways. The tracks which start with the letter M are placed medially. And four cranial nerves in medulla oblongata, four cranial nerves in pons, four cranial nerves midbrain and above. The cranial nerves, which can divide 12 into equal parts, are placed medially. For example, third and fourth in the midbrain are placed medially because three can divide 12 into four parts. Four can divide 12 into three parts. So three and four are placed medially. When we come to pawns, five, six, seven, eight, only six can divide 12 into two equal parts. Five, seven, eight cannot divide 12 into equal parts. So five, seven, eight are placed laterally. When we come to medulla oblongata, nine, 10, 11, 12, only 12 can divide 12 into one equal parts, whereas nine, 10, 11 cannot divide 12 into equal parts, and therefore nine, 10, 11 are placed sideways. So three, four, six, and 12 are placed medially in the medial part of the brainstem. The other cranial nerves are placed laterally. So rule of four, the cranial nerves and what cranial nerves are placed medially and what cranial nerves are placed laterally. The cranial, the structures which start with the letter S are placed sideways. The structures which start with the letter M are placed medial. So if you remember this, your brainstem is over. Very, very interesting rule. Easy rule and easy to tell everything about brainstem. Yeah. Now let's go to the cerebellum. Cerebellum, you have three important structures. Flocculonodular nerve or archicerebellum, the oldest. Vermis paleocerebellum, the medieval, the cerebellar hemispheres, neocerebellum, most recent. The archicerebellum is concerned basically with eye movements and orientation and balance. Remember fish. So flocular nodular node or archicerebellum, the oldest, it's concerned with eye movements, control, and gross orientation space like fish. Vermis paleocerebellum, medially, medieval, it is concerned with gait and locomotion like snake. Remember snake, you can remember vermis. Cerebellar hemispheres, the neocerebellar, the most recent part is concerned with precise movements of the extremities like monkey. So remember fish, snake, and monkey. You can remember all the three important functions of the cerebellum. That is the flocculonodular node, vermis, and cerebellar hemispheres. Spinal cord. Spinal cord, there are six important diseases. One is syringomyelia, wherein the medial 
where in the center of the spinal cord is affected. The spinothalamic tract ascends and crosses over and then ascends again. So when the center of the spinal cord gets affected, only the spinothalamic tract is affected. The other tracts are spared. That is the posterior column is spared. The pyramidal tract is spared. So they'll have dissociated sensory loss. The sensations carried by spinothalamic tract, mainly pain and temperature are affected. The sensations carried by posterior column are spared. This is known as dissociated sensory loss. Whereas if it is transverse myelitis, all the tracts below the spinal cord gets affected. Motor and sensory and sphincter dysfunction below the lesion. Brown sequard syndrome is a hemisection of the cord, usually trauma. Only half of the cord gets affected. And therefore, posterior column and pyramidal mass manifestations are same side. Spinothalamic tract manifestations on the opposite side because spinothalamic tract crosses and then ascends. Anterior spinal artery. Anterior spinal artery supplies all the parts of the spinal cord except the posterior column. And therefore, anterior, anterior spinal artery syndrome causes corticospinal tract gets affected, spinothalamic tract gets affected, but posterior column, which is supplied by the postspinal artery, is spared. In posterior spinal artery syndrome, only the posterior column gets affected. Subacute combined degeneration is because of vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 is essential for myelination. So all the important tracts and nerves which are well myelinated only gets affected. So of all the tracts, it is only the posterior column and pyramidal tract are well myelinated. Spinothalamic tract is least myelinated. So in vitamin B12 deficiency, subacute combined degeneration, corticospinal tracts and pyramidal tracts are affected, whereas spinothalamic tract is spared. When you take large fibers and small fibers, large fibers are well myelinated. So large fibers get affected and small fibers get spared. So in subacute combined degeneration due to vitamin B12 deficiency, corticospinal tract, posterior column, and peripheral nerves are affected. Yeah, cranial nerves. Cranial nerves, first now, all fraction smell. Uh, the dysfunction causes anosmia. Very important function of the, well, very important concept of the olfactory nerve. It is one of the commonest nerves which gets affected during head injury. So after head injury, usually they develop anosmia, loss of smell. Olfactory groove meningioma can cause uh, loss of smell. Uh, Foster Kennedy syndrome can also cause a loss of smell. Optic nerve is concerned with vision. So you have impaired vision, you have visual field defects, you have pupillary abnormalities because the pupillary pathway afferent is second nerve and different is the third nerve. Oclomotor now. Oclomotor now, if it gets affected, it produces four Ds. One, there's a dilatation of the pupil because the parasympathetic fibers of the third now causes constriction of the pupil. Very important concept is that parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve. So any extraneous compression like posterior communicating artery aneurysm or herniation affects the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers and therefore the pupils are affected in posterior communicating artery aneurysm or herniation wherein pupil on one side is dilated because the parasympathetic pupillary constrictive fibers are affected. Whereas if it's an intrinsic third nerve palsy like diapers, it affects the center of the third nerve but spares the parasympathetic pupillary fibers. So pupil is not affected usually due to, due to the dioptic third nerve palsy. In fact, it is known as pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. So if third nerve gets affected, they'll have dilatation of the pupil because the parasympathetic fibers gets affected. They'll have drooping of the eyelid because the levator palpebrae superiors gets affected. They'll have divergent skin because the medial rectus is affected. The LR6 lateral rectus will overact. So they'll have divergent skin. And because of that, they'll have double vision. If a person has got double vision on seeing near object, it is a third nerve palsy, medial rectus. If a person has got double vision on seeing far off objects, it's a sixth nerve palsy, lateral rectus palsy. Trochlear nerve is responsible for intorsion, especially when you read a newspaper or when you get down these stairs, you use superior oblique intorsion. So if superior oblique gets affected, they cannot intort the eye. In fact, they'll compensate by turning the head to the opposite side, which is known as Belchowski sign or head tilt sign. Trigeminal now. Trigeminal now, the three important com components are motor, sensory, and spinal tract. Motor. If the trigeminal now motor gets affected, the jaw deviates to the side of the lesion. Easy to remember by remembering rule of 17. If 12th nerve and 5th nerve gets affected, the movement will be towards the disease side. Whereas if the 10th nerve and 7th nerve gets affected, the movement will be towards the healthier side. 10 plus 7 is also 17. 12 plus 5 is also 17. So if 12th nerve and 5th nerve gets affected, the movement will be towards the disease side. If 10th nerve and 7th nerve gets affected, the movement will be towards the healthier side. So motor part gets affected, the jaw deviations towards the side of the weakness, disease side. Sensory nucleus gets affected, they'll have impaired light, touch and pressure over the face and spinal tract gets affected, they'll have impaired pain and temperature over the face. Sixth nerve, all the ocular muscles are supplied by the third nerve except the lateral rectus which is supplied by sixth nerve and superior oblique which is supplied by the fourth nerve, LR6 and SO4. So if abuse nerve gets affected, they'll have the, uh, lateral rectus palsy, so they'll have double vision on looking at far off objects. If facial nerve gets affected, innervation of the muscles of the facial expression gets affected. So they'll have facial paralysis. 
Uh, vestibular portion of the eighth nerve gets affected. They'll have basically vertigo, nystagmus, vomiting, imbalance, and nystagmus. And the cochlear portion gets affected. They'll have deafness. Seven nerve, an important concept is that you have upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron type of seven nerve palsy. All the cranial nerves have got bilateral innervation. And therefore, hemiplegia usually does not affect cranial nerves except seventh nerve. Because seventh nerve has got upper part and the lower part. Upper part, like other cranial nerves, has got bilateral innervation. Whereas the lower part gets innervation from the only the opposite side. So in a UM and lesion, they'll have hemiplegia on the opposite side and the lower part of the face gets affected on the side of hemiplegia. Whereas if it is LM and like, like Bell's palsy, both upper part and the lower part of the face gets affected. In fact, they'll have Bell's phenomenon. When they attempt to close the eyelids, you can see the eyeballs moving upwards. Bell's phenomenon is a normal phenomenon, but well seen in persons with Bell's palsy. Ninth now, gloss of pharyngeal now is concerned the loss of sensation over the posterior one third of the tongue. Vagus nerve supplies all the laryngeal muscles and therefore if the vagus nerve gets affected, they'll have dysarthria, dysphagia, nasal regurgitation and hoarseness of voice. Accessory nerve supplies the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. So trapezius shrugging of the shoulders gets affected, sternocleidomastoid gets affected. They cannot turn the head to the opposite side. One important concept of the sternocleidomastoid is that it has got a predominant ipsilateral supply. And therefore, in the frontal lobe example, on the left side, if it gets affected, frontal life fields area number eight gets affected. So they cannot turn the head to the opposite side. Head will be looking towards the same side. They'll have hemiplegia. The sternocleidomastoid also gets affected on the same side. So they cannot turn the head to the opposite side. Head will be turning to the same side. So head turning to the same side, eyes also to the same side, hemiplegia on the opposite side. It's a frontal lobe lesion because sternocleidomastoid muscle gets a predominant ipsilateral supply. Hypoglossal now, again, they'll have, especially it supplies tongue, so they'll have wasting, fasciculation, and weakness of the tongue. Remember, rule of 17, 12 plus 5, movement is towards the disease side. 10 plus 7, movement is towards the healthier side. Yeah, now we are done with peripheral nose, uh, cranial nose, now we'll go to the peripheral nose. Peripheral nose, you have the motor component, you have the sensory component, you have the autonomic component. The motor component, again, here are two important concerns. One, you have the axonal type of the neuropathy. Second is the demyelinative type of neuropathy. When the myelination gets affected, when it is demyelination, conduction velocity is lost because we have read it in physiology, saltatory conduction. When there's well myelinated, an impulse jumps from one node of Ranvier to the other node of Ranvier, and therefore the conduction velocity is great. But the moment the demyelination, the myelination is affected, the conduction velocity is affected because saltatory conduction is affected and therefore velocities are decreased when you do no conduction studies in the demyelinated lesion. Whereas in an axonal lesions, the amplitude gets affected in the, uh, no conduction studies. Another important point is that axonal neuropathy is a length dependent neuropathy. So the most distal parts get affected, example, the feet and the hands, and they start ascending up like dioptic uh, neuropathy where the feet and the hands get affected. Whereas if it's a demyelinative lesion like a gulen barre syndrome, it's a length independent neuropathy. Both proximal parts and distal parts get affected equally. Example, gulen barre syndrome. So dioptic neuropathy is an axonal neuropathy, length dependent neuropathy. The distal parts get affected more than the proximal parts, including the weakness. Whereas a demyelinating neuropathy is a length independent neuropathy, proximal and distal parts get equally affected like gulen barre syndrome. The sensory component, as I said, the distal parts get affected. So they'll have glove and stocking type of sensory loss. The autonomic component gets affected. They'll have orthostatic hypotension, sweating impairment, and in men, erectile dysfunction. Very important, easy bedside test for autonomic involvement is postural hypotension. Just check the blood pressure on supine. Ask him to stand up, and after three minutes, again, you check the blood pressure. If the fall of systolic blood pressure is more than 20 and diastolic pressure is, fall is more than 10, it indicates person has got postural hypotension and it is suggestive of autonomic neuropathy. Yeah, then neuromuscular junction, myasthenia gravis. The classic example of neuromuscular junction, myasthenia gravis, the classic uh, presentation is fatigability, easy fatigability. History is very interesting. Persons may be non-vegetarian or vegetarian, they may be taking, for example, uh, chicken. Initially, they'll be able to chew. But as time passes, they develop fatigability and they find it very difficult to chew the meat. Initially, they could chew the meat easily. Finally, they can't even make, make an attempt to chew. So if that is the kind of history you're getting, that means it is fatigability, that means you have to think of uh, neuromuscular junction uh, disorder, easy fatigability, myasthenia gravis. And then another important point, myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscle, not smooth muscle. So they'll have ptosis, levator palpebrae superioris, they have the uh, ocular muscles getting affected. 
because they are also skeletal muscles. But pupil is not affected in myasthenia gravis because pupil is smooth muscle. So myasthenia gravis causes weakness, double vision, but pupil is spared. If pupil is spared and uh, with, with ptosis and extra ocular muscle involvement, it is myasthenia gravis. So they'll have ptosis and proximal muscle weakness and sparing of sensations. And finally, the last part of the localization is the muscle. If it is myopathy, the proximal muscles are more affected than the distal muscles. Classic example is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy where the proximal muscles get affected. Very important function of proximal muscle is to help in getting a person from squatting to standing position. So a person is not able to get up from squatting to the standing position and finds it difficult and climbs on himself. It is characteristic of a proximal muscle involvement. Classic example is Gower's sense in Duchenne muscular atrophy and they also have sparing of sensations. Yeah, these are all overview. I've given very important topic localization in neurology. But if you want individual points to be known about frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, individual cranial nerves, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts. In fact, I made 15 parts of cognitive neurology only on higher functions. I made a, a lobar functions 15 videos. So you can go back to my uh, YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts, to get a detailed idea about individual components of the neurology localization, where I have more than 8,000 subscribers and 250 plus neurology videos, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts. You can even uh, subscribe, like, and share my uh, YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts. Yeah, as the sir has already said, all the important concepts of neurology, I put it in a question answer format known as focused neurology, uh, available online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. Yeah, and once again, I thank uh, Dr. Kishan Rao and Vitami from the depth of my heart because with this wonderful opportunity, I'm able to address the entire student community across India. In fact, across the world and wonderful opportunity you have given me. So nice of you, sir. Yeah, over to the, I think I finished in time about one hour. Over to Dr. Kishan Rao and White Army for any comments or suggestions. Thank you, sir. White Army, Dr. Kishan Rao or the organizers, Sampath. I find about uh, 10 comments in the chat box. If anyone is uh, going to tell me, I'm willing to answer it. Good morning, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sir, shall I read the comments, sir? Yeah, sure, sir, sure, sir. The uh, sensory pathway from uh, face, sir. Try channel pathway. Sir? Sensory pathway from face, sir. That is trigeminal pathway. Where they go and uh, this one, sir. Yeah. So trigeminal now you have actually some two to three important concepts. One is that the pain and temperature pathway goes right to C2 and then starts ascending. So if there's a lesion there, only the pain and temperature gets affected. Uh, touch question joint vibrations and are spared. And second concept is that the the sensations over the lateral part, like ear, and as it comes to the cheek, are placed very lower down. But when it comes to the medial part, it goes higher up. So in a lesion where the cervical area gets affected or in the, in the distal part, the distal parts of the, the sideways of the face gets affected. Onion peel appearance, onion peel sensory loss. Whereas if it is in the more proximal parts, the center of the face gets affected, which is known as onion peel appearance. Second thing, uh, generally, for example, if thalamus gets affected, all the sensations are lost on the opposite side including the face and the upper limb and the lower limb. But if the medulla oblongata gets affected, especially the Wallenberg syndrome, the descending quintothalamic tract and opposite spinothalamic tract gets affected. So facial sensory loss is on the same side and sensory loss on the body is on the opposite side. So facial sensory loss is on the same side, on one side ipsilateral and contralateral sensory loss on the opposite side of the body, it is a medulla oblongata lesion. But if thalamus gets affected or if the parietal cortex gets affected, all the sensation, including the face and the body is affected on the sideways. And only parietal cortex gets affected. That means only the cortical sensations are lost. So where do, where do these uh, trigeminal nerve uh, means localize, sir? Sensation. Are they perceived in the nucleus or uh, in the parietal cortex? Sir? 
that's what sir all the primary see there are two types of sensations primary sensations and cortical sensations the primary sensations namely touch pain temperature position joint vibration sense are carried from the sensory receptors and go to the level of the thalamus from the thalamus what goes to the parietal cortex are the cortical sensations so if the parietal cortex gets affected only the cortical sensations namely tactile localization two point discrimination graphesthesia barognosis and stereognosis gets affected but the primary sensations namely touch pain temperature joint position vibrations will be intact okay sir sir should we check uh, cortical sensation in all dermatomes if only if the yeah when the primary sensations are intact you have to check the cortical sensations if the primary sensations itself are absent there's no point in checking cortical sensation because cortical sensation will be obviously lost so if the primary sensations touch pain joint position vibrations are intact then you have to check the cortical sensations sir why only facial nerve is affected in internal capsule region and not other corticobulbar tracts yeah very important point sir uh so i am a student sir please don't cost sir yeah no 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 sir very, very interesting in fact i i, I for lack of time i was not able to go beyond sir all the cranial nerves sir we have cranial nerves motor and uh, non motor for example seventh nerve is a motor nerve for example if you take eighth nerve eighth nerve is purely sensory nerve so eighth nerve is not affected in a in a corticospinal tract lesion corticospinal tract goes and goes to the motor part of the cranial nerve nuclei so you have cranial nerve nuclei on both sides brain stem so for example seventh sixth now a sixth now or fifth now they get the cortico bulbar fibers cortico the same side as well from the opposite side so if one side the cortico spinal fibers get affected the cranial nerves do not get affected because these get compensation from the opposite cortico spinal tract that's why in a case you have seen so many hemiplegic patients they don't have cranial nerve involvement at all because all the cranial nerves have got bilateral innervation even one side if it is cut off there's no problem the other cortico spinal tract comes and compensates but there's an exception facial now has got two parts upper part and the lower part upper part and the lower part upper part supplies the upper part of the face and the lower part supplies the lower part of the face upper part of the facial nerve nucleus which is in the pons like other cranial nerve has got bilateral innervation so even if one tract gets affected the other tract comes and supplies and therefore upper part of the facial nerve does not gets affected because it has got bilateral innervation whereas the lower part of the facial nerve gets innervation only from the opposite side cortico spinal tract and therefore the cortico spinal tract on one side for example right side is left side is affected the opposite right lower part of the facial nerve nucleus gets affected lower part supplies the lower part of the face and therefore the lower part gets affected so upper part of the face does not get affected because they got bilateral innervation like other cranial nerves the catch is the lower part of the facial nerve nuclei which gets innervation from only the opposite side and therefore in a cortico spinal tract lesion uml lesion in any plegic patients only the lower part of the facial nerve nucleus gets affected that means which supplies the lower part of the face and therefore they have the lower part of the face getting affected whereas if it is element palsy bell's palsy what we see in uh, in our practice it is the below the nucleus so both the upper part and the lower part gets affected so both the upper part and the lower part on the same side gets affected so bell's palsy is an element type of seventh nerve lesion whereas in hemiplegia the uml type of seventh nerve lesion where only the lower part of the face gets affected because the upper part of the face is supplied by the upper part of the facial nerve which gets bilateral innervation because of the bilateral innervation upper part does not get affected okay sir sir can language be affected in internal capsule lesion sir no language is a purely cortical uh, uh, function language is not affected in internal capsulation so that uh, medial uh, side you said uh, m from starting from m no sir tracks yeah. can you repeat yeah all the tracks which start with the letter m are placed medially very easy to remember very difficult to remember and and mark all the important points of the brain stem so very important easy rule tracks which start with the letter m motor part of the cranial nerves m medially motor tract cortico spinal tract that's why medial medullary syndrome the cortico spinal tract gets affected whereas lateral medullary syndrome varan dog syndrome cortico spinal tract does not get affected so motor tract cortico spinal tract is medially placed medial longitudinal fasciculus mlf which connects third nerve fourth nerve sixth nerve with eighth nerve is medially placed and medial lemniscus posterior column they are also placed medially so medial lemniscus posterior column is placed medially medial longitudinal fasciculus which connects third fourth sixth eighth nerve is placed medially motor tract that is the cortico spinal tract is placed medially motor part of the cranial nerves is placed medially when it comes to s 
sideways. The structures which are placed sideways start with the letter S. Spinothalamic tract, pain and temperature is placed sideways. Sympathetic tract, which is concerned with pupil, is placed sideways. Sensory tract of the trigeminal nerve is also placed sideways. And the sensory part of the cranial nerves are also placed sideways. So sympathetic tract, spinothalamic tract, and sensory part of the trigeminal nerve, spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve. Sir, so, and then last question, in postural hypertension, after how many minutes of standing we should check the BPC? After about three minutes, sir. Three minutes. The okay. fall should be more than 20 systolic and 10 diastolic. Okay, sir. Yes, that's all. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So if there are no questions, we can close the meeting, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir.